Can we bow our heads in prayer, please? Our oh, gracious Father, we just thank you once again for this beautiful Sabbath day and our time to study uh, the book of John, guiding us with the profound insight that the book contains, and it's always to glorify your name. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What we are going to look at, I'm going to read a, a, a bit out of uh, Barnes' commentary, and and he has stated that compared to the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John contains more about Christ or more about Jesus Christ, his person, design, and work than any of the other three Gospels. So that's a very insightful uh, thought there. Okay, so it's very important what he has just stated here, that the, that the book of John gives us a very uh, insightful uh, understanding of Jesus and his revelation. The other evangelists were employed more in recording the miracles and giving external evidence of the divine mission of Jesus. John is employed chiefly in telling us what he was and what was his peculiar doctrine. Okay? What was his peculiar doctrine? His aim was to show first that Jesus was the Messiah. That was his first emphasis, to show that Jesus Christ is the Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for. That was his first emphasis and make and he wanted to make sure that that was understood second to show from the words of Jesus himself what the messiah was or what was his role what was the role of the messiah the other evangelists record his parables his miracles his debates with the scribes and pharisees john records chiefly his discourses about himself. If anyone wishes to learn the true doctrine respecting the Messiah, the Son of God, expressed in simple language but with most sublime concepts, to learn the true nature and character of God and the way of approach to his mercy seat is to see the true nature of Christian piety or the source and character of religious consolation to give perpetually before to have perpetually before him the purest model of character the world has seen and to contemplate the purest precepts that have ever been delivered to man he cannot better do it then by a prayerful study of the Gospel of John. And that is profound, what Barnes has stated. Yeah, that that's the way to the most holy place. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. If you really want to know, and this is what he's, he's stating, that compared to the other three Gospels, no doubt the other three Gospels was also focused on Jesus. But what John was doing was focusing on the person of Jesus Christ that he is the Messiah and why he is the Messiah and, and what he came to do. It may be added that this gospel is of itself proof that cannot be overthrown of the truth of revelation. See, this gospel of John is the truth of what? Of the revelation that this Messiah, Jesus Christ, came to give to the world. Go ahead, John. So this would have been written several years after the other Gospels? Yes. So would, do we assume or do we know if John had copies of the letters? Because that wouldn't have been in any Bible. There was no Bible then. Right. The Old Testament scriptures. Exactly. So do we know if he would have read the other sort of letters and things? Well, he, even if he had, even if he had, let's put it this way, even if John had read the other three Gospels, yeah. or even if he was exposed, because John wrote 
at the end of uh, close to 100 years, at the end of, this, of the century. So he wrote close to uh, uh, 100 AD. And by this time, all the uh, other writings were completed. So when he's writing, even though he might have been exposed to all of this, but if you read the book of John and you see the profoundness of the way he writes and how different his writing is compared to the other three gospel is, is no question uh, very profound. So what I was thinking is, was he trying to expand on what was missing on the other three gospels? Yes. Yes, and, and, and I mean, he states it here. What man in that rank of life, that is John, now could compose a book like this? At this stage in his life, you know, he's close to uh, uh, it, it, quite old. And, and, and can it be conceived that any man of that rank, unless under the influence of inspiration, could conceive so sublime notions of God, could present so pure views of morals, and could draw a character so intimately lovely and pure as that of Jesus Christ. See, and we, we, see, we use this word pure quite often. But we must make sure that when we think in terms of even what uh, Albert Barnes has stated here, when we're thinking of the pure message, the pure character, and the purity of what Jesus revealed and presented about God, that word pure means that there is no form of what? Contamination in Jesus' teachings. Everything Jesus taught had no contamination in it at all. He was presenting the purity of God's character. Because if it is not pure, then it goes back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil wasn't pure. There was a mixture of good and evil from Satan's domain. Isn't it true that... Uh this disciple, John, seemed to have a special relationship with Jesus. I mean, he was fine with all of them, but yes, even John says, the disciple that Jesus loved. Yes. It seemed there was a special, and he was sitting next to him at the, the Last Supper, and all of these things seemed to say that he had a special insight and knowledge and of how things were and should have been and needed to be to believe all that Jesus did and said. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. See? And he's the one who seemed to have lived the longest. Yes. Yeah. And this is why, if you think, you know, the same could apply to us. Let's say if we started studying the scriptures at the age of 20, let's say. And, and here we are, say, in our 80s and 90s, for example. Well, if we were consistently and persistently, prayerfully studying the scriptures, what we learned when we were 20 years old and what we will learn when we are 90 years old has to be vastly what? Different. Has to be. If not, then what it means is you've had a stunted growth. You haven't had a growth, you see? And people must realize this, that as we keep studying and the deeper we delve into the Holy Scriptures, and especially Jesus and his revelation of God, this will keep developing and building up in our lives. And a deeper and deeper understanding of God will come through. Okay? And this gospel, the gospel of John, will stand to the end of time as an unanswerable demonstration that the fisherman who wrote it was under a more than human guidance and was according to the promise that he has re recorded gui that guided him through 
the guidance of the Holy Spirit into all truth that he kept pointing to nobody else but Jesus. It will also remain an unanswerable proof that the character which he has described, the character of the Lord Jesus was real. See? And, and like I say, as we're going to look at the book of John, we will see this. And we're going to see why, compared to all other inspired writings of, of the Bible, all other, okay? And that is the, the 66 books of the scriptures. Jesus is the only one that stands out compared to all and gives us that profound and, and insightful revelation of God that was not there. And, and we're going to be covering this in our, in our uh, message this morning. He's, Jesus has a perfect character. And that word perfect character means that there was nothing that had any kind of a flaw in Jesus' revelation of God. None. So everything Jesus taught, and as John wrote it, was in its pure form, with no form of adulteration, which means to say nothing of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil had in it. And he says it here. It has not a flaw. See? And that really is um, really related to that knowledge that, I mean, it, not related, but if you, if you compare it to the knowledge of good and evil, you know, he's the tree of life, Jesus is the tree of life, but if you compare the two, one has good and, and, and evil, but Jesus does not have that mixture. And I think that's no. what it really applies to. He has no mixture of good and, and evil. It's See? completely righteousness or goodness or love, whatever you want. And it's pure. See, yeah, so that, that understanding for us, that's why I'm saying over and over again, we will keep going back and looking at the tree of life principle and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because once we have understood that properly, we will see in the scriptures things that we could completely miss and then end up with a flawed understanding of God's character. So he asked, how, was, how has this happened? The attempt has often been made to draw a perfect character and has often in every other instance failed. Now he's taking... Um, how is, it, how is it when Homer and Virgil and the ancient historians have all failed to describe a perfect character with the purest models before them and with all the aid of imagination that in every instance they have failed? With the most profound imagination, whatever it was, they wrote Virgil and Homer, but it failed in giving that perfect revelation. How is it that this has at last been accomplished only through the writings of a Jewish fisherman who learnt it from nobody else but Jesus Christ? See? A fisherman, not some scholar. Bear that in mind. Not some scholar, but a fisherman learned through Jesus and wrote what he wrote. That, sorry, that should encourage everybody in the world to say, I can learn about this just as easy as anybody else. In fact, probably more so there you are. than all the educated people who think they know and they don't get it right. Well, we, we, we got enough proof in the New Testament that these so-called uh, Fishermen. Okay. What what did you say? Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about the other side of it. Yes. Words. These ordinary people that didn't have yeah. all of these scholastic uh, things behind them. They were just simple students. And they allowed Jesus and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to teach them and what they ended up learning and revealing. 
But on the other side too, there were people that were very studied, like Paul, and he, he had a huge mm -hmm. contribution. So I think what really, the, what makes the difference is whether your spirit is open to receive. So no matter what class you belong to. Yes. Yeah. Well, look, we know, I mean, take the Apostle Paul himself, okay? No question that he was a, 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 a theologian, a doctor of theology, okay? But before Jesus, with all that education, with all that insight that he had of the Holy Scriptures, all, but he did not know the God of the universe until he learned it from Jesus. That's how important this is, you see? Doesn't matter how much, and, and we, we must not overlook this fact, that we could have the same problem today, okay? And I'm not in any way negating what the scholars are capable of achieving and doing and sharing, but that does not mean that the scholars have the true and final understanding. That is extremely important to understand that even ordinary, simple, fisherman type of people under the guidance of the Holy Spirit can get such insight from God, about God, and that only through Jesus. So none of us should feel in any way that we are not able, or able to learn such profound uh, things, such insightful things about God. Every one of us can. That's why it's often said that absolutely new Christians, or even Muslims particularly, or anyone who doesn't know anything about Christianity, are more likely to learn and accept it much quicker than those who have learned it incorrectly. Very good point, John. Very good point. See, if, and, and, and I'm bringing the Apostle Paul again, yeah. Saul before he became Paul, okay? He had all this education. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees in that sense, okay? With all that brilliant mind and education. We know he must have had a brilliant mind because of the way he wrote one third of the New Testament. Okay, so here we got a person with all that brilliant mind, with all that uh, scholastic background, but he and he studied, he knew the scriptures, but he studied with the wrong mind. He studied the scriptures with the principle of good and evil, not the principle of life. You see, and the same thing can apply to any scholar today. Makes no difference. Or any person. Any person makes no difference. If we study the Holy Scriptures through the prism of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we don't study the Holy Scriptures, which is what John emphasizes, if we don't study the Holy Scriptures through no one else but the person of Jesus Christ, then we're going to end up understanding the scriptures through the knowledge of, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll end up with that knowledge, but not the knowledge that Jesus came to impart. Okay? John describes one who he believed had a divine nature, and we know that in John 1.1, 1, 1, we're going to look at that. It is an attempt to describe God in human nature or to show how the divine being acts when united with man or when appearing in human form. Okay? So that's why his emphasis. What does he do? When he starts his gospel, he makes sure that this is understood. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, the emphasis there is that 
the word Jesus Christ was God because only God could give you the true revelation of who? Of God. No one else can, can he? So that's the emphasis. And sometimes we, we, we talk of Jesus as God and which is fine. But if we don't understand and make this emphasis that the reason he claimed what all he claimed about himself and that's why uh, the writers could attribute to Jesus the, 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 uh, the character or the personality of God himself is because he as God could only give us the true revelation of God. No human being could give. That's why Jesus himself said this. You know, in John chapter 5, he did say this. You search the scriptures for in those scriptures. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. These scriptures, and, and when Jesus is stating this, we don't have the New Testament. So what scriptures is he talking of? The Old Testament. These scriptures testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me and learn from me, I'm paraphrasing, and learn from me that you have, may have life. See? And then when he says these scriptures testify of me, if you go back and look from Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, <coughs> pardon me, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And who is the creator? In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then from the New Testament, we find out and we learn who is the creator. That is nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ. So there we have it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And who was this person who created the heavens and the earth? In the whole universe. Nobody else but the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that. See? And the description is complete. Of, of what John gives of Jesus. There is not a word expressed by the Lord Jesus or an emotion ascribed to him inconsistent with such a supposition. The supposition is that him being here on earth as God is giving us a true revelation of God. Okay? And I, well, let me finish this. Homer and Virgil and all the ancient poets have undertaken to show what the gods would be like, plural, the gods would have been like if they came down and conversed with men. And what, they, and what were they? What were Jupiter and Juno and Venus and Mars and Vulcan? B pay attention to this one. These were beings, okay? These were beings of lust, of envy, of contention, and blood. And blood. So all belief system, according to John, all belief system that had a, and I'm, I'm not trying to be blasphemous, but every belief system that promotes a bloody God is not the true God. It's not. Well, in those gods that you mentioned, Juno, who were they? Well, he, he, he goes through. He, he, he starts off with Jupiter, Juno, Venus, Mars, Vulcan. Yeah, well, those are all gods, and gods are pretty much just the fallen angel. Yes. And they all operate by the tree of the knowledge. Yes. Of See? <clears throat> Any, go ahead. So, we're starting this study now, and we must always remember anything that Jesus said or did or tried to correct or anything is exactly the same as if God Himself was saying. Yes. Never ever does He say or do anything different. So, when it says that Jesus said to them so and so, it could just as easily have said, and God said to them. Yes, yes. So, see, that's why Jesus said, I and the Father 
are one. Yeah. See? And then he said, if you have seen me, you have seen, you have seen the Father. So That's what he's talking of. Yeah. See? And when John writes in John chapter 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Go ahead, John. That's why we, it's good we have these Bible studies. Because when it says nobody has seen God, yes. you have to understand he's not talking about physically. Yes. Or if he is, he's referring to spiritually. Yes. And if you don't understand that, you can say, oh, but it says in the Bible, so and so saw God or something, or talked with God. And they did. And, they did. and the Bible does say. But spiritually, that's what it was. Spiritually, yeah. they were learning spiritually. It's not. Right. Very important. And the reason why we know it's spiritually because it says no one has seen God, but the Son of God has declared him. See, and it says, yeah, but keep in mind, the emphasis is no one has seen God at any time. Physically. Yes. No, no, no. They did see God physically, but none of them knew God the way they should have known God. Because Moses saw God... Uh, there's, there's, and, and Moses even wrote, he spoke to God face to face. It's written there. Oh yes, and Isaiah, they, they saw God. And unfortunately, I don't have all the passages, but I can... But what John is stating here in, John, uh, in verse 18, when he's saying, no one has seen God at any time, he's not referring really to the physical. Because he says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Which means to say, and this is very serious, okay? That's why John is the person that has written the way he has written about Jesus and Jesus' revelation of, of, of the Father. So, nobody prior to Jesus' coming... Nobody prior to Jesus coming knew God the way Jesus revealed God. That's what it means. No one has seen God at any time. There's a difference though between knew God or thought they knew God and saw God. Are you saying that Moses actually saw a physical uh, God in front of him? I believe that's what the Bible says. Because Moses wrote and said that he spoke to God face to face. It doesn't mean to say he saw him. He could still have spoken to him without, through a cloud or something. Well, according to what I have understood, when it says he spoke to him face to face, then it is a face to face conversation. Even though it says nobody has seen God. Yes. But so that's the spiritual. Story. Yes, that's the that's the point that yeah. has to be understood because there's enough in the Old Testament scriptures where people spoke and saw God, okay. and but what you are bringing out that's the uh, aspect that John is stating, because look in verse 17 he says the law was given through Moses, yeah. but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. See. Then he says, no one has seen God at any time. The true character of God came through Jesus Christ. Yes. That's the bottom line. Yes. And Prior to that, it was not there. That's right. That's right. See, because he, the writers have said this. The people who sat in darkness, that was referring to the Gentiles, and the people who sit in darkness were referring to the Jews. Mm -hmm. Both Jews and Gentiles sat in darkness until Jesus Christ came and gave that revelation of the Father. And that, that is, that's why I'm saying this is so, so important. And as we're going to uh, study uh, the book of John, we will see, we are going to see how clearly John has laid out what is so important for us living at this stage uh, in the history of the world. And, and there's another, another uh, verse in the Bible that clearly shows the role of the chosen people, the, the tribe, you know, the, the sons of, of Jacob. Um, it's in Revelation 12, verse 1. It says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. Revelation chapter 12. And the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This is talking about 
the, you know, the, 12. the people of the, the chosen people, the 12 tribes and so forth. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Okay, so this to me is, is summarizing the whole history before Jesus' second coming, I mean first coming, and their role, their role was to give birth to that child. The child who would then reveal the true character of God, see? So their role was not to reveal the character of God because they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They were human beings. Only a divine being could reveal who God was. So they gave birth to that child, and then that child reveals the character of God. And that's why the Old Testament is so full of genealogy, you know, and that was the role that they played. Mm -hmm. The role that God gave them to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if this, like I say, if this is understood clearly, it'll be very, very important. So here again, uh, 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 when Barnes has written about uh, Venus, Mars, Vulcan, uh, uh, Jupiter, how has it happened that the only successful account which has been given of the divine nature united with the human and of the living and acting as, as became such a union has been given by a Jewish fisherman. By a Jewish fisherman that the combination of the divine and human nature was given by a Jewish fisherman. All the others that gave in their writings about God coming and, and, and being there, whether it was uh, through uh, Isis or through uh, those Egyptian gods, they did claim that God incarnated in those gods. But none of them, none of them gave a true revelation of God. None of them, okay? And the only one that gave was, as the emphasis here is, in the writing of John the Apostle. As he wrote about Jesus and Jesus' relationship with the Father. Now, we'll close with this here. How, unless the character was real and the writer under a guidance far superior to the genius of Homer, and the imagination of Virgil could write anything without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, nobody could have given this kind of uh, understanding. Go ahead, John. So when Jesus was talking to them and teaching them 2,000 two years ago, they had some knowledge, but most of it was not correct. And that's what Jesus came to correct. And as I see it, that's exactly where we are today. For the last 2,000 years, we've got some more knowledge, but most of what the different churches teach is incorrect. So we're in the same position as the people were when Jesus came the first time. And now we're going to get, hopefully, and I'm sure we will, get the corrected version of all that, get it straight, which Jesus came to do 2,000 years ago. Yes. And we are going, again, like I say, in our, in our message this morning, we are going to see how all of us living here now, before the second advent, we are playing a pivotal role like the apostles did at the first advent. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. It's the same Believe me, this is serious stuff. Yes. This is really serious stuff. When we'll, we'll see it in our message this morning. That the first advent, what Jesus came and gave the apostles at the first advent, us living here, now before the second advent, the same message is to be given to us and we are to proclaim it to the world. If not, we have failed in our calling. We have failed in our calling. Now, just one example. 
from the Old Testament pointing to Jesus. And this is Moses writing. I'm just giving one example. The Lord your God, Moses writing, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst and from your brethren, him you shall hear. God the Father, and I, I, and I don't want to go and complete this thing, God the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration said the same thing. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear him. If God the Father has told us living here now at the end of time, that we are to listen and hear to no one else, not Moses and Elijah, but to the person of Jesus Christ, that is our work. And the book of John is going to be covering this. Thank you all.